Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. All right. Welcome to Newton Church of the Way. My name is Aaron Groves. I'm on staff here, and I'm going to be leading you through announcements this morning. Who's, uh, who's excited to celebrate the 4th of July tomorrow? Yeah. All right. Well, hey, I'm going to start off with uh, talking about our parade. This year, the way is going to be walking in the parade. We did have a registration sign up online. If you registered for that, you got a t-shirt, and I will have your t-shirt for you tomorrow when you show up to walk. We will be meeting in the DMAC parking lot. Look for the giant white truck with the boom truck. We'll have a flag hanging off of it. It'll have the way um, banner on the side of it, and it'll also have a banner with a logo like this and a piece of scripture on it saying, we the people need Jesus. Amen to that? All right, so show up for that between 9 and 9.15 tomorrow in the DMAC parking lot. All right, if you want to, you can follow along in your bulletin. I'm going to give you a few announcements, and then we'll go into a meet and greet. So Hope for Hurting Parents, that ministry is going to be on Sunday, July 10th, so next weekend at 6 p.m. First Monday's with Mamas because of the holiday weekend is actually going to be second Monday with Mama this month. So if you have a little one and you want to get involved with that ministry, that'll be at 9.30 a.m. on July 11th in the nursery here at the church. Kingdom Builders Couple Study is going to be coming up. That's going to be on Thursdays through July from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Discipleship Center. That's going to be really exciting because it's going to be led by our uh, men's ministry and our leaders from that ministry, but it's going to be open to couples. So it's not too late to sign up for that and to go to that. They're going to be working through the Book of Ruth. Uh, Little Sparks, I'm really excited about this one. I've got a, uh, a kid going into kindergarten, uh, Miss Alicia has taken upon herself to set up a little ministry for them during the first service. Um, and that you bring your kids in, you worship with them, and then you walk out in the hallway, hand them off, and they get to do some uh, little activities where they get to learn more about Jesus with Miss Alicia and other leaders. So that's exciting. Um, last announcement I'm going to go through is the one-hour prayer time. So usually on the second Saturdays we meet here, and uh, go through a prayer time where you can receive prayer or you can be a part of the prayer team praying over um, different things that's been laid on our heart throughout the month. This month, we're going to be meeting at the uh, Baxter campus. So if you want to receive prayer or you want to take part in prayer, you can meet us up at our building, our satellite campus in Baxter, and we'll be praying through that space and praying for anyone that shows up and needs prayer. So we welcome you to that. That's on three at 3.30 um, next Saturday. All right. We're going to go time into a time of worship. Before we do, let's stand up and meet and greet one another. your heart, what stirs your soul, what matters come to mind, the cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. Seek and you will find Joy 
still comes in the morning Hope still walks with the hurting If you're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord oh! Don't stop dancing and dreaming There's still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord The years roll by, we wonder why We lost our way from home Our father finds the child inside We left for growing old Awake, awake, awake my soul Joy still comes in the morning Hope still walks with the hurting If you're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord Don't stop dancing and dreaming There's still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord Let everything let everything, let everything praise the Lord In the working, the waiting Let it praise the Lord In the blessing, the breaking Come on and praise the Lord In the dying, the rising Come on and praise the Lord in the morning hope still walks with the hurting if you're still alive and breathing praise the Lord don't stop dancing and dreaming there's still good news worth repeating so lift your head and keep singing praise the Lord joy still comes in the morning Hope still walks with the hurting If you're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord Don't stop dancing and dreaming There's still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord Amen. I just want to welcome everybody once again to Newton Church of the Way. I see a lot of red and a lot of white and a lot of blue out there. So I hope each of you enjoy your celebrations with your families this weekend or whatever it is you're doing, camping. Have a great time. Uh, but thank you for making it a priority to come out here this morning and join with your church family to celebrate. Amen? I, I applaud you going to continue here, so uh, you are encouraged to join with us. Oh, 
thank you, Lord, for your abundant love that was shown to us on the cross of Calvary, the blood that you shed to cover our sins and take them away, cleanse us completely. And Lord, there's nothing that we could ever say or do to repay that debt. You gave it freely, and all you ask is that we receive it. It is a gift, and we thank you, Father, for your love and provision. And it's out of the abundance of your love for us that we return these gifts and tithes and offerings as an act of worship, as an act of service to your church. And we thank you, Father, for using these resources, blessing and multiplying them, Lord, to your kingdom's purpose, to reaching the lost in this community, those who don't know the love that you bring who don't know the hope that you have given for eternity, that you are preparing a place for us to 
come and be with you. And Lord, we look forward to that day. And meanwhile, we will lift our praises to you and give you thanks. Amen. You may be seated. If you're troubled, heavy-hearted, come to Jesus and find your peace. If you're run down, empty-handed, come to Jesus and find your strength. He is hope for the hopeless rest for the weary help for the hurting he is he is bending the broken bearing the burdens all that you're needing he If you're wandering in the darkness, come to Jesus and find your way. If you want freedom, need forgiveness, just come to Jesus and find his grace. He is hope for the hope. Rest for the weary, help for the hurting, he is, he is. Mending the broken, bearing the burdens, all that you're needing, he is. Comforter, counselor, prince of peace, author and maker of everything defender deliverer king of kings he is he is helper and healer forevermore savior and shelter through every storm my refuge redeemer and lord of lords he is he is child of heaven and son of man Provider, protector, the great I am Alpha, Omega, beginning and end He is, He is Hope for the hopeless Rest for the weary Help for the hurting He is, He is Mending the broken thank you so much for your word today and and Lord as we celebrate this weekend the birth of a nation there's so many key things that of your word that this nation was built upon Lord as time has gone by we've drifted in many ways and Lord before we as your people can tell everybody else how they should be behaving We need to learn to do it for ourselves. We need to take your word, Lord, and we need to make it a part of our lives. Such a shaping part that literally the way we live will be a testimony to your truth. So Lord, bless us today. Use your word with power to 
to inform us, to transform us, and to empower us to be your people and let our lives in many ways be a part of our witness. We pray this all in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hello, everybody. Welcome here today on the 4th of July weekend. Again, there are certain times throughout the year where everybody gets a little extra star in their crown when they come to church, and 4th of July weekend is one of those weekends. So I'm glad you're here. Um, it's good to see you all. Uh, we have, we've, we're continuing our series in uh, the book of Colossians. And uh, last week, uh, we had Celebration Sunday, and we were celebrating uh, baptisms and, and all of these things that God is doing in the lives of his people. And, 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 and one of the things we talked about last week was this idea that we have these choices in front of us. Uh, we went all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 30, where it talks about blessings or curses. And oh, that you would choose life. Uh, and, and that is this idea. So we're, we're talking about making choices as Christians that ultimately have this ripple effect. Um, and one, one of which is that we live these lives in abundance. Uh, and so we live in a very interesting time today. And, you know, everybody has all these ideas of what we as a nation need to be doing. Um, and, and that's fine. You can have, obviously, that's a part of who we are uh, and the way things work. But I do think there's a general principle at stake that I think is lost. And I think that if we, as the people of God, are going to be witnesses, then there's this aspect that we have to live it out first. And we have to live it out in such a way that it's like this illustration for other people uh, to look at, to follow. Um, and, you know, the degree to which this occurs is going to be the degree to which you have greater influence to share the truth about Jesus Christ. And so we've been building, uh, if you've been in this book of Colossians, you know that we've been working the, to this point in chapter 3 where uh, Paul lays out his whole case about who you are in Christ, uh, that you're complete in Christ. When, when you put your faith in Jesus, you are circumcised by the Holy Spirit, and that it's a circumcision of your heart. And by virtue of that, there's certain ways that you should behave, one of which is that you put off sin. You, 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 you work harder and harder as you go through life, as the Holy Spirit and the Word of God works over your life, you're convicted by sin, you repent, and you continue to grow stronger and stronger, more into the image of Christ. Last week, I only gave you two verses, uh, and it talked about how, uh, as, we, as we dove into that, it talks about how you need to let the message of Christ in all of its fullness fill your lives. We're going to back up just a little bit to verse 16. So we're in Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the message about Christ in all of its richness or fullness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing songs, hymns, spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. There's a little element that's missing in our modern day society that is the key to living a life that is Christ-like. And it's called mortification, which is a key Christian principle that, quite frankly, today, we stink at. And matter of fact, when I tell you what mortification means, if you don't know already, you're going to sit there and say, well, yeah, but do we really do it? Mortification is the principle of dying to yourself and living for Christ. This is the key Christian principle that virtually hardly any Christians do. We're, we're kind of in that have it your way. I grew up with the McDonald's commercials. Have it your way, right? And everything was just all about you. What do you want? It's going to make you happy. Do whatever makes you happy. This is all about you, 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 and you. And we are raised with this message, and we get to a point, even in our Christianity, where we still think it's about us. And it isn't. And then we get, we're, we're kind of in this weird place where um, we hear these words, to, to dying to yourself and living for Christ. And Jesus says, if you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. 
And we're like, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, I agree with all that. But I don't live it out. Jordan Peterson, who's a psychologist, and I've quoted him before, and maybe some of you know who he is, but one of the things, he wrote a book called 12 Steps to Life, and, and one, of the thing, one of the primary uh, things that he put in there, one of the primary steps to life, is he said this principle. He says, before you go out and save the world, first go home and clean up your own room. And if I could just dare say, we live in a time where everybody's an expert, But do their actions and the way that they live bear that out? And this isn't about an arrogant thing. It's not about a bragging thing. It's about about uh, about affirming what you're saying is true. And so we kind of live in that time. We all know how everybody else should be acting. Are you doing it? And it starts with you. And we've established throughout this whole series everything that you need to be successful if you are believing in Jesus, you have everything. You you are lacking, no, there's no heavenly blessing you're lacking. Um, Positionally, you are completely redeemed, completely restored in Christ. But conditionally, you still have sin that you carry around. You have baggage that you've accumulated, and it frames your worldview, it creates a bias in your thinking. Um, And so you have to be wary of that. Bit by bit, gradually, you need to live this life, and it starts with this principle, the old you is dead. And as we go through that, I mean, it's, it's interesting, as Paul talks about this message about Christ, he goes into practical application, and he, and he chooses a couple of areas. One is marriage. How does this apply in marriage? Talk about before you save the world, go home and clean up your own room. Here's an example of areas that, uh, that you need to clean up within your own life. Make it a heart reality, but also make it a home reality. You need to clean up the way that you behave at home. You need to clean up the way that you treat your spouse. You need to clean up the way that you treat your children, and if children, the way you treat your parents. And you need to clean up the way you act in the workplace. These are the kind of messages where it's like, uh, there's one of two ways we react to this, because none of us do this perfectly. None of us. So we can either get down on ourselves and think, oh, man. Or we can turn adversarial and just shut up the messenger. i got to warn you, I have a microphone. You're not going to silence me today. And also bear in mind, this isn't, these aren't my words. This is a discipline when it comes to Scripture. It's, it, 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 here's the truth, and it's like, okay, and, and immediately when you start talking about things, people immediately come up with excuses why this can't be true. And I would urge you not to do that. In a perfect kingdom place, this is the way it's supposed to be. We don't change that because we fail. What we do is we change us so that we can succeed. And that's the way it is when it comes to all of God's standards. We, we don't change them point is the spirit wants to change us so we talk about marriage or we talk about relation parental relationship with our kids or we talk about workplaces i understand that there's a lot of yeah buts out there i get it and i under i totally understand but that doesn't change still what god is calling us and empowering us to do it's just a question of whether or not we choose blessings or curses life or death, and whether or not we strive to this, because these are the areas where God's going to help us. Now, before that, just to give us all just a, I want to tell you a joke. Uh, This is a marriage joke, so. There's this little girl that, uh, obviously, so many years later, you know, they now have the Disney Channel and all that stuff, and don't get started about the Disney Channel, but the point is, little girl, she watched Cinderella for the first time, and she watched the whole movie, and she Later that day, she went to her grandmother. She goes, Grandma, I saw this new movie called Cinderella. And the grandma goes, oh, honey, I saw that movie too when I was your age. And the little girl goes, you saw this movie? The grandma goes, yes. And the little girl goes, okay, what happens at the end? And the grandma goes, they lived happily ever after. And the little girl goes, no, they didn't, Grandma. They got married. poke fun at this because I know we, we begin we talk about marriage now before we begin with a teaching on marriage we begin 
with Jesus' words. And it's really important. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. And these are very simple words. I hear things all the time from non-believers, uh, even kind of Christians that just, I don't think they're that well informed. They make these statements. Like, have you ever heard the statement, Jesus never talks about marriage? That is absolutely, unequivocally wrong. He never talks about gender. He never talks about sexuality. All of those things are not true. And every time I hear that, usually it's on TV, I just want to shout to the TV, that's not true! So here I'm going to prove it to you. So Matthew 19, and these are the words of the Lord. So we start with verse 3. And it says, Some Pharisees came and tried to trap Jesus with this question, Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife just for any reason? And this is what Jesus says, Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning God made them male and female. Stop right there. Don't let that just wash by you. One of the keys about marriage, biblical marriage, is it's a man and it's a woman. And it's a created man and a created woman. And I'm not trying to talk about anything else. I'm trying to point out to you what God's design is. And if we, as Christians, no matter how lost or how sinful we are, if we want to pursue God, we have to know where he's working and what he's calling us to. This was a created order. And it says, um, from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, that explains why a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, but no one split apart what God has joined together. And there are, they're talking about divorce. They're talking about all of these situations. Why did Moses say that in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts. So we have things in our society that are a concession to our hard hearts. And it's an acknowledgement that we are a broken creation. So if you're here today and you've gotten a divorce or you've been in a situation, there is the created ideal and then there's the fallen reality. Doesn't mean, you know, per se that anybody made it, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging why people do what they do. I'm just saying that in a perfect world, these things wouldn't happen. And it's all corrupted by sin. And so it says that, um, he says he permitted it, it's not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. Jesus' disciples then send to him, this is the case, it's better to not marry. Not everyone can accept this statement, Jesus said, only those whom God helps. Here's the key part, God helps. Some are born as eunuchs, meaning, so some people are born physically unable, it says some people have been made eunuchs, and I, I don't want to go, but, but basically a eunuch is a person that's had parts of their anatomy removed, which prevents them from certain marriage activities, intimacy. It says some people, have, and it says some people cho choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So marriage is not the highest existence of man. That's the other thing. So if you're single here today, don't hear me saying that if you're not married, that you're somehow lacking something. If, if you're married to Christ and you're living out, um, it says, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, let anyone accept this who can. So I want to cover all of our bases first before we begin. Jesus affirms marriage between a man and a woman. Marriage is not the highest existence of man. You can actually spiritually achieve a higher existence as a single person. So in other words... Sex, intimacy, is not the highest existence of who you are. So if you're in a place where that isn't happening or uh, you're being told that, that that shouldn't occur because it's immoral, don't think in any way that that diminishes you because that in itself does not make your life fulfill. Jesus does as Christians. So a lot of people think, well, you know, people should be able to do what they want. And it's like, well... You know what? But it's not going to fulfill them. 
It's going to leave them looking for more and more and more and more. If you don't have Jesus, then everything, not, not just intimacy, but every part of your life, there's a fulfillment that only occurs through being reconciled with God through Jesus. And, and that's the premise of what we're talking about here. So in that light, we go to our, back to our Colossians text. And we go to Colossians, and he begins with these, these wonderful words that I know every woman here is going to love. Wives, submit to your husbands. Okay, just want to make sure. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. A couple of other things I want to explain. Here's what submission doesn't mean, because I know that we take, we take biblical terms and we have a worldly slant on them, and we get what's called, we, we, we get a bias. So we hear the word submit, and we think that submit is a bad thing because it's been abused. And maybe in your past, somebody in authority over your life has abused you in some way. That's on them. It's not on the word. Just because people abuse certain things in society doesn't mean that, you know, you should blame God or his design, um, which th that takes a discipline to separate the two. Um, but, you know, it's no different than, so it would be kind of like, if my wife makes chocolate chip cookies, you're going to say, oh, chocolate chip cookies are good. If I make chocolate chip cookies unless they're in the tube you're going to say you know I don't like chocolate chip cookies who do you blame do you blame the cookie and so you, you have to understand this is so we get this, these biases uh, that are in our thinking and when we hear the word submit there's a whole lot of baggage that comes into that that's, that's done by people that were sinning or not doing what they should do but in a perfect world it's completely natural for the wife to come alongside her husband. And, and the word submit, it doesn't mean devalue. It doesn't mean to make them second class. It means that there's an authority in the husband, in the home. And I always tell people that I, I can prove it to you. I, I mean, all it takes, I, I, can remember, I can remember every good affirming thing my dad ever said to me and I can remember every negative thing my dad said to me because he had an authority in our home now my mom she said a lot of things too and I, I mean it's not that I devalue her role I do and I remember a lot of those things but when my dad spoke and when he spoke in a certain way it had an authority to it and doesn't devalue or diminish the value of my wife or my mom or any other woman in my life. We're all equal. But authority is, is about influence and responsibility. And so part of what you could roll into this idea of submission is wives understand your husband's responsibility to God, whether he does or not. And that's unfortunate too, is that a lot of men, they don't get it. They just don't get it. Uh, a lot of men, I remember uh, Gary Thomas said this, and it, 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 many, many years ago I heard this. We always talk all the time about God the Father, but we don't spend enough time talking about God the Father-in-law. Right? God is just as much of a father to my wife as he is to me. Count of my life, and part of what I'm going to give an account for is how I treated. If I'm given this authority in my home, what did I do with it? Did I use it to pump myself up? Did I use it to get what I wanted? Or did I use it to serve my wife, to strengthen my wife, to support my wife, and to strengthen my kids and raise my kids and make them strong and, and, and all of these things? And so this is a big part of what we have to understand. And that's why um, I'm far, far, far from perfect. So I come into a place like this, and I feel like as a pastor, I have to talk about what we should aspire to, all the while all the while realizing where I have fallen short. But at the same time, I never ever look at my wife and, and I don't want her to be this submissive, um, you know, they, they, a lot of people like to drag out those, uh, what is it, the handmaiden with the red robes and the white hats? Nobody wants that. Nobody's sane. I want my wife to be as strong and beautiful as God wants her to be. 
And I'll tell you what, there's very few people that can stand toe-to-toe with me in a conflict, and she's one of them. And I thank God for her. I think it's great. She is one tough little lady. And so, um, it, it, but I don't, we're partners. I don't, I don't, and I'll tell you something else. Um, not the best to read, husbands, to read this verse to your wives. Uh, it's just, I don't recommend it. I think that goes back under the umbrella of fix your own room first. Before you tell your wife what she should be doing, you should be doing what you're doing, what you need to do. Uh, and then, perhaps, then all things kind of fall in place. So, wives, uh, submit to your husbands at his fitting for those who belong to the Lord. If you want, um, Paul actually expounds on this in Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, we'll go to that. I want to start again. He starts, he starts out Ephesian, in Ephesians 5, he starts it out very similar to the way he, he works uh, in Colossians. He, uh, starting with verse 15, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools but like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. This is key. What does the Lord want you to do, and where is he going to work, and how is he going to help you? It goes on to say, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing that thought, he moves into and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he kind of, he raises the bar a little. Not just wives submit, but wives and husbands submit to each other. And what does that mean? There's, There's a mutual submission. But for wives, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. And it paints this picture. But I think what drives this is understanding your husband's accountability to the Lord. And women are described as helpers. They're helpmates. And so we're designed to complement each other and to work together. And I think you need to understand your husband's responsibility to God, whether he does or not. And again, most men don't understand their responsibility to God. Now, that shouldn't be the case amongst believers. Um, I don't know that it's most amongst believers, but in the world, it is certainly most. Don't understand. And it goes on to say, a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, some people, now, I've heard this joke too. The wife says, well, if he's the head, I'm the neck, and I'll turn the head wherever I want it to go. Right? You get in this weird place in the church um, where we roll this into what we think women should be doing and not doing. And so, um, you know, we talk about women uh, leading in a church, and some people say, well, women shouldn't lead in church. Well, okay, but they lead in the home, and then they, you know, how many times does a husband show up to a a consistory meeting amongst elders and deacons with all the talking points that his wife gave him? So who's leading? And so, I want to be very mindful of these things, and I want to, I want to understand. Um, it says that it says he is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husband in everything. Stop right there. Let's, let's take a look. Everything? No. Everything godly. And that's a big part of it. You, you, at no point, wives, are you to submit to your husbands when it comes to abuse. At no time are you to submit to your husband if he's telling you to do something ungodly, unbiblical, or immoral. Just like everything else in life, all bets are off. If if what you're telling me to do is going to tear down my life and it's going to take me further away from God, my submission, uh uh-uh. My submission to Christ out-trumps anything else. This assumes that in this relationship, that, that everybody, by God's help and to the best of their ability, is going to try to live out their call to the Lord. So, uh, go back to our text, go back to Colossians. And now we look at the men. It says, husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. 
There's going to be a theme that comes through here. Husbands, love your wives. It's interesting. I don't think, and and I'm going to go off the reservation here just a little bit and, and kind of share some things with you based on my experience. My experience, I think it's harder, it's easy for a man to love his wife and and to feel love for his wife. It's hard for him to show it in a way that she feels loved. And part of the reason why is because God has made our wives so wonderfully complex. And they have different love languages. So like one thing works for one person, doesn't work for another, and and here we are, these, these ignorant men going through life trying to figure all of this out. And it's not easy to do, but we need to figure it out. We need to make it a priority. We need to make it extremely important in life. And uh, it, it's not, I mean, it just there, there's, this, there's this piece where the way God created our wives is that she needs love. She needs it. You know, you, sometimes you run into these husbands who are like, well, I told you I loved you on our wedding day. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Wrong. You tell your wife you love her every day. Every day. And if you and and if you can't tell her, show her that you love her. And it's just so important. And I'm not talking about being Mr. Big Stud, you know, I'll show you I love you, babe. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sacrifice, serving. Loving your wives when you come home from work and everything in your mind wants to go out to the shop and fiddle around or wants to watch your favorite TV show or just disconnect your brain and go into your nothing box, give her at least 30 minutes and listen. Listen. And be careful because I, I, you know, how many times have we guys said, well, that's what we're going to do. And we just sit there, we slip into our, unbeknownst to her, we slip into our nothing box, and then we hear those fateful words, what did I just tell you? Uh, I have no idea. Right? Anybody been there but me? Maybe I'm just the only one that's been there. So you have to be careful of that, but you have to be tuned in. You have to care. You have to care about how she feels. You have to understand that this is how God created her, and that she needs this. She needs it. And you know what's funny is the more you do this, you find yourself as a man actually getting to a point where you want to know how she feels. And you care. When things hurt her, that's not okay. When she's feeling, and you want her to feel heard, you want her to feel um, all of these things. There's an old saying when it comes to relationships uh, in marriage, and it says, men, before a woman wants you to touch her body, she first wants you to touch her heart. And men, we don't understand that because if you want to touch my heart, you touch my body. So it's, it's opposite. And we have to be mindful of that. And so there's, there's just all of these things that are in play. Always remember, it's not about value. It's not about one person being better than the other, stronger, or any of these things. It's about role and how God is helping you and what he's going to do. And we're designed... We're designed to uh, trusting. We go back to our text in Colossians. Love your wives. Never treat them harshly. The way that we treat our wives harshly is to make them feel unloved. You want to hurt your wife? Say something unloving. Or do something unloving. Make her feel like she's bothering you just to want to talk to you and spend time with you. Guys can do better. We start out in life... And we think the ultimate pinnacle of manhood is to love many women. When in reality, the greatest pinnacle of manhood is to love one woman deeply. So deep that she feels the depth of that love. And I'm just telling you guys, you got to work at it. You got to work at it. Uh, Sometimes we men think, well, I'll just go to work. I'll show my love by working. And and being faithful and doing all these little things. And you know what? That's good. We should do that. But we also have to make it a priority to touch our wives' hearts. And I don't know. I can't tell you specifically what to do because they're all different. And, you know, it's funny because sometimes I feel like just when I find the buttons, they move. 
right? You ever feel that way? It's like, well, I did this the last time and everything worked and she felt great. And now it doesn't work. I don't know what the deal is. It's, but that's, it's called it's a dynamic relationship. It's a changing relationship. But nonetheless, this is where God is going to be working in us at home. I want to take you to be fair. We go back to our Ephesians text. And you'll notice that, that um, the Apostle Paul writes way more instructions for husbands. And I'm a firm believer because you cannot have authority without responsibility. You just can't do it. It, it. It's not a dictatorship. It's not a monarchy. In the kingdom of God, authority, influence, goes with responsibility and serving. And so, in verse 25, it says, Husbands... This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Jesus gave up his life for the church. Men, you are to give up your lives for your wives. And it says that, he says he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she'll be holy and without fault. You know, one of the things that women want desperately, and, and quite frankly, if you look at the way the world attacks women, is women desperately want to have this sense of purity. They don't want to feel dirty. And the world wants them to feel dirty. As a loving husband, in a loving marriage bound by the Holy Spirit, part of what you get to bestow upon your wife is a sense of purity. And that's why it's so important that, that as a man, you, you guard that with your life. And so, it's, you know, he, he did this, a, a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. It's it's the way that Christ loves the church and the way he purifies the church and makes the church feel loved. Um, all of these things. It's just this illustration. The same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. It's interesting to me. So a man and men, what we need to do is we feed our bodies because we know if we don't, they get weaker. You need to take the same mindset to your marriages and your wives. Same thing. If if you're not investing in your marriage and it starts to go south on you, the tendency is to blame the wife. The only problem is, men, you're the leader. You can't, it'd be like me going, to, going and leading an organization and it falls apart. I mean, you say, well, it fell apart because of all the employees. Nobody listened to me. Nobody did, you know, and blame everybody else. But if you're the leader, guess what? It's your fault. I remember the time that I remember the time that I, I went to this class. I was taking this class. It was a calculus class in college, and I went to this class. And the professor didn't even hardly speak English. So you're sitting here. So we get to this class. There's like 50 of us, and you know you're taking calculus to begin with, which you have to because it's you know it's part of the. It's like one of those classes you got to take, and uh, then you have a professor that nobody can understand what they're saying. I came the next week. And like two-thirds of the class was gone. Um, and I remember the professor started railing. And it was very hard for me to understand, but basically he was blaming all the students. And I think that you have to understand if you are the one giving the message, it's your responsibility to help people understand. And if you're the leader... It's your responsibility to help people understand what you're trying to tell them. And somewhere that's, that's lost, and that's so lost as well. But that really goes in marriage. I oftentimes find if there's a miscommunication error in my home, it's oftentimes, it's not necessarily often my fault, but it's always my responsibility to try to resolve it, which means I need to understand and I need to we need to come to some kind of a consensus of what is right. Husbands, love your wives to love their own bodies. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. Men, if you're in a situation and you don't like your marriage and you don't like your wife and nothing has been done, uh, like, really traumatic uh, in the situation, the way out of the bad situation you're in is to start 
taking care and feeding and tending to your wife spiritually and emotionally and start loving as Christ loved the church. It may take a while. You can't undo something. You know, if oftentimes people come in for marriage counseling and there's been a lot of, a lot of trauma, a lot of things said and anger, a lot of uh, activity that is gone, but it's still the same way to fix a marriage. And it's not about just staying married, even though that should sustain you in the really hard times. We want to have a thri- you want to have a thriving marriage. You want to have this marriage where, where, where everybody is, is benefiting and, and amazing things are happening, and, and that's what we all want, and this is the key to it. Husbands loving their wives and wives trusting their husbands. And the two of them coming together and partnering together. And that in itself is what leads us into children. I don't think it's a coincidence that as Paul is writing this letter, he goes, he goes he, uh, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And children, always obey your parents. Now, again, um, not, so we get ourselves in this situation where children are not always well treated by their parents. Right? But not all things done to children that they don't like is mistreatment. So we're in this weird gray area, right? So I could, you know, there's times where our kids complained like we were torturing them and we weren't. Right? And so, but I do believe that it all stems from kind of an orderly foundation. So here's the orderly foundation. And again, I, I, there, are, there are always exceptions to the rules, but in my experience, this is what happens so number one if you're a christian number one your number one relationship in your life is jesus your number two relationship is with your spouse plain and simple and i do believe that these things flow so my relationship with christ it feeds my relationship with vicky my relationship with vicky and christ feeds my relationship with my children and that's that's how this goes um Oftentimes, kids, what they want from their parents is to see love and unity. Now, that's not always the case that happens. Sometimes behind the scenes, kids see lots of conflict, and they hear lots of words, and a lot of things are going on. But at the end of the day, they're going to be looking at the relationship between mom and dad, and they're going to be making evaluations of what it means to be married based on what they see. If you come from a broken home or you come from a place where you are given a poor example, you have to acknowledge that and you have to allow the Spirit of God to change your thinking and your bias. Change your thinking and your bias. If you're a person that has been married multiple times, at some point you might want to start to think, maybe it's not everybody else. Maybe it's me. And in any case, in every relationship, if you are in a marriage that does not work out, it's easy to blame everything on the other person. And you know what? Maybe in some rare cases, that is true. But oftentimes, the way that you kind of move forward from a broken relationship is you really kind of try to, you go back to yourself, it's like, what part of this should I own? And that's how you learn from it. That's how you learn from it. And, and this is, and, and this is a, so with kids, oftentimes children, they grow up in this environment, and we don't even realize the environment they're growing up in. And again, there's always exceptions to this rule. But if you're wanting your kids to obey, you as parents, how are you at obeying authority? How are you? If you want your kids to listen to you, how are you at listening? And there's another thing, one of the things that I would tell you to do. Um, So it says, children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Then it goes into fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. Why does it talk about fathers aggravating their children? 
goes back to the authority issue. Fathers can aggravate their children by being a tyrant, by, by having an iron fist, being uncaring, only showing up when, it, when discipline is required and disciplining them without loving them. But there's also a flip side to ways you can discourage. You can discourage your children, men, by not being a leader, not being a good leader, being absent from their lives, um, having this, this kind of this passive, timid, permissive attitude with your kids. You're not actually sitting there and uh, doing all the things that you need to do. And so this is kind, this is kind of this picture. And again, I understand that it gets really, really difficult if mom and dad aren't together anymore and there's maybe two homes or, or th- all of this stuff. It's very difficult. But at the same time, we don't change God's standard just because we fall short of it, because every one of us falls. I'm pretty sure that I have discouraged my kids at times. One of the things that, that is important, and this is something I heard a long time ago, when it comes to discipline and it comes to interacting with your children, you always have to remember the 10 to 1 ratio. The 10 to 1 ratio is positive affirmation versus critical conversation. It's 10 to 1. Sometimes as parents, we can find ourselves in a situation with our kids where we're always having a critical conversation. Uh, you, you didn't do this right. You need to do this differently. You didn't do that right. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. But we're not giving the affirmation and the love that they so desperately desire. It, it, and it's just oppressive. And some of you grew up in homes like that where maybe you had a parent that never told you what you were doing right, never affirmed who God created you to be, but always was there to tell you what you were doing wrong. And that's extremely aggravating and discouraging. And there's an old, there's an old uh, uh, principle that basically says truth minus love equals rebellion, and truth plus love equals transformation. Now, many of you are here today, and you did everything that you could, and you, you loved your children, and you told them about Jesus, and you did all that you could, and things still didn't go the way you wanted it to. But you did what you were supposed to do. It's up to your kids to decide whether or not they're going to obey you as parents, whether or not they're going to honor you as parents. And so, again, also remember, too, that the final chapter hasn't been written yet. You just might be in a really hard season. Maybe, maybe, maybe God will get in there and will move in such a way. But I would urge you fathers, in light of this text, make it a priority to say these three phrases to your children. I don't care how old they are. Phrase number one is, I love you. Tell your kids. Tell your wives, I love you. Tell your kids, I love you. I love you. Number two is, I, is, I'm proud of you. Fathers, tell your kids, I'm proud of you. You know what? Look at what you did. I'm proud of you. This isn't about participation trophies or anything like that. This is about seeing who they are. And as they go through life and as they battle through adversity, coming along as a father and saying, you know what? Good for you. I'm proud of you. And the third thing is, is I love who God created you to be. Don't try to conform them into your image of who they should be. Instead, come alongside them and affirm who God created them to be. I love who God created you to be. Now, you may say, I love who God created you to be, except in these areas, because then I don't love that. And those, that's, again, 10 to 1. There is a place for critical conversations, and they're necessary. You know what? Our kids are, are lost, too. And they do things they shouldn't do. And as a parent, you need to deal with that. And you need to speak the truth to them. But make sure that you're putting all the other in there too. Our words have power. And all that being said, all that being said, I am well aware that there are exceptions to the rule. This is not a formula for perfect success. And that if you, th- this is this, what this is, is, is basically it's an outline of what everybody should be doing. And you have to make a decision 
well, they're not doing this, but you need to do what you're called to do. And this is, this is what Christians, this is not about us. It, it, it's about dying to ourselves. And so if, if you back up just a little bit and say, and you go back to the instructions for husbands and wives, it's not okay for me to say, well, I would love my wife if she would do what she's supposed to do. That's not okay. I need to submit out of reverence for Christ, and I need to love her because that's what Jesus wants me to do. And, you know, as a wife, you say, well, I would submit to my husband, but he just, you know, if he, if he just do what I want him to do. That's not okay. Um, you know, when it comes to the relationship with children, you know what? Um, I, 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 would don't, I don't want to aggravate my children, and I don't want to discourage them, but you know what? They don't listen to a word I say. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. This is a principle for life. Do what God is calling you to do. Before you save the whole world, you first need to clean up your own room. Before you as a father can tell everybody else or a husband what everybody else is doing wrong, get yourself right. Before as a wife, you can tell, you know, a mother, you can say, well, you know, everybody's doing this wrong, and everybody's doing that. You know what? Get yourself right first. And, and, and then you have more authority in your words. Still doesn't guarantee that, that everybody's going to do what they're supposed to do, but it does mean that you did what you're supposed to do. And if life happens in such a way that there's lots of sadness and things going on, at least you have the peace of mind in knowing I did what God told me to do. And at the end of the day, I can live with that. I can live with it. It goes on, and then he goes into the workplace environment. And I know that, again, another objection that you hear about the Bible is that it basically validates slavery. And I hate that argument, and I'll tell you why. Because the slavery that we had 200 years ago in this country is not the same slavery that they're talking about here. It's servanthood. It's indentured servants. It's all of these things. They didn't have labor laws 2,000 years ago. So basically, you, had, you were a servant, so you had the employer-employee relationship was a servant and a master relationship. And, and so it, it helps you to understand what's going on here. So Paul is not telling people that they should be slaves. He's telling people that you should work for whoever it is that is taking care of you, that, that's paying your bills. He goes, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything that you do. And people look at that and say, well, that's not relevant for today. Well, it is if you break it down to employees and employers. And you may say, well, my employer is not my earthly master. I agree. I agree. However, he is a provider. And I think one of the biggest mistakes we make, and I know that, again, this is not about what they do that justifies what you do. It's what are you supposed to do. And you also have to remember that when you go to work for a company, they're doing you a favor by giving you employment. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm doing them a favor by working there. Yeah, maybe it's a mutual benefit. But, but it goes both ways. And, and, and there has to be this appreciation there. It says, try to, try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. What do you do at work when you don't think anybody's watching you? How about conversations that you have? Here's an interesting thing. How do you talk about your spouse? How do you talk about your children? How do you talk about your employer? And, and, and these are all things that you have to believe that God has, God has blessed you with. He's given you in your life. How do you, how do you talk about such things? How do you talk about your employer? It says, serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Serve them not because necessarily because they deserve it. Serve, it. serve them because of your reverent fear of the Lord. If it's really bad, then go find another job. But, know the difference between toxic and difficult. A lot of people think that everything difficult is toxic. It's just difficult. Everybody thinks that, you know, 
if it's, if it's difficult, I have, the best thing I can do is just leave. Well, what if there's something good for you by going through and enduring the process? If it's toxic and it's tearing you down, then you need to leave. And you need to be mindful of that. It says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you're serving ultimately is Christ. You're serving Jesus. But if you do what is wrong, you'll be paid back for the wrong you've done, for God has no favorites. This goes back to the blessings and the curses. Now again, there's always... There's always bad situations. Everywhere you go, there's ugly situations. But we are called to submit to our employers. Employers are called to be just and fair to their employees. Just and fair. Remember, you also have a master in heaven. Doesn't matter how high up the economic chain you reach, you are accountable to God for the way that you treat people. Couple of, uh, a couple of characteristics in a good employee that moves into a good employer. As, as a good employee, they call it diligence, which is a persistent work ethic, loyalty, punctuality, responsibility, integrity, and do you have a positive influence on your work environment? Think This goes back to what you talk about. Do you use your influence in the workplace to create dissension and division, or do you use it to help people? Create a a positive environment. Employers, um, no favoritism, justice. Do you take things based on, so if a person is all these things, um, do you take that into account? Um, Fairness, uh, fairness in wages, words, evaluations, and critiques. And this is kind of this bigger picture. So these are all the things. So again, we come back to this place. If we are going to say that we're followers of Jesus, how do we live it out? If we're telling everybody else what they should be doing, how's our marriages? How's our relationship with our children? How are we as employees or employers And if those things are out of whack, what are we doing in the name of the Lord to get them to a place where they need to be? I'm much more interested in what goes on in my home in the eyes of God than what goes on in your home. And it's not because I feel like I'm better or more important than you. It's because I have no control over what you do. I I can only choose for me and what my family does, and how I'm going to serve my wife. How am I going to love my wife? How am I going to interact with my children? How am I going to do these things? And I'm not, I'm not going to compromise on my love for Jesus, because that always comes first. But sometimes, you know, this is the part that's kind of interesting too, and you know, you see lots of young students that are oftentimes, they have all kinds of ideas about how people should be living. And I, I, I think they should be able to express their opinions. But I got to tell you, if you're a young person, okay, if you're a teenager or you're in your early 20s, um, let me say this with all the love I can muster, but you haven't even begun to know what life is all about. Right? So you, you got some college student lecturing some person who's in their 40s or 50s about what life is all about, it doesn't come across as very effective. Before you save the world, go home and get your own room in order first. And I think if we as Christians follow that, if rather than focusing on what everybody else is doing, we should focus on what God is doing in our homes, in our lives, in our hearts. How is what Christ has done in my heart playing out in my home? before I pray about, and you should, we should be praying about the nation, but sometimes we're quick to pray about issues we see on television and not about the issues in our own home. 
And I just want to let you know, in, in the spirit of total confession, when Vicki and I were first married, even though I grew up in a home where my mom and my dad had a good marriage and uh, this great example of what it looks like, when we first started, I was 21, and I was so selfish. Man, not that guys who are 21 are ever selfish, but I was. And we would have lots of conflict whenever Vicky would have a thought that in any way went up against mine. And, you know, I, I even, I, even though I wasn't much of a Christian, I would say, you know, we should never let the sun go down. We should never go to bed angry. That's a famous saying. But translation was, I'm going to beat you into conformity of my point of view. And all that is wrong. It's wrong. And I'm thankful that God changed my heart about it. I'm thankful that somewhere in the process of over 30 years of marriage, over 31 years of marriage, I realized that God loves my wife just as much as he loves me. And I want her to be everything that God created her to be. I want my kids to be everything that God created them to be, all because I love Jesus. And you know what? He's, he knows way more than I do. Way more. And it takes humility, humility to sit there and say, you're in this weird place. I'm called to lead, but I don't have all the answers. Guess what? That's the best place to be because you need to be connected to the one that does have the answers. And that's the power of this. It's very convicting. I don't care who you are. I can say this with absolute certainty. I don't care what stage of life you're in. I don't care how much you love Jesus. There's always room for improvement. Amen? So what we do then is as we move into this time of communion and we move into this time of worship, let's not think about anything else. Let's think about our own homes. Let's pray. Let's pray for our spouses. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray. If you're, if you're at work and, and you know, you're just like, oh, I just can't stand my boss, pray for him. If you're an, if you're an employer and you've got this employee that's just like, oh, man, pray for them. Let's do our part and watch how God does his. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word today. And Lord, I do just pray those prayers. I pray, Lord, that for all the, the men that are here that are in marriages, Lord, I pray that we would be aware of the ways in which we can improve our leadership and our love for our wives. For the wives that are here, Lord, I pray that they would receive that. And that they would understand that their power is, is in being a helper and a partner in marriage. God doesn't want them to be devalued or, or, or to be abused in any way or, or to be hurt. Lord, help us to be loving and kind towards each other and to serve each other out of reverence for you. Lord, I lift up the children of this congregation. May their hearts not be troubled. May we as parents that are imperfect, Lord, may we not prevent them from coming to you who is the perfect father. May you help us in our time together with our children and in our prayers with our children. Guide us to pray in accordance with your will. And Lord, help us at work. Help us in these places. People are, people are coming in and they're hurting and they're angry. And Lord, how can we be positive influences on our workplace? Whether if you, were, you are an employer or a person of uh, a supervisor, of, uh, so to speak, in your workplace. Lord, how can you be somebody that helps others? As employees, Lord, how can we, how can we be you in the workplace? Lord, we ask that you would bless these elements, that you would use them, Lord, to strengthen us. And Holy Spirit, you would unite us with Christ as only you can. Help us feel close to Jesus. Help us to, to feel the power of the cross. Help us to be the people that you're leading us and guiding us to be. We pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this to remember me as often as you eat it. Then afterwards he took the cup, and he said, this cup represents a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by my very own blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. The bread which we break, the cup which we drink, represents the body and the blood of Christ. All here present that acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you are invited to this table. You hunger and thirst for his righteousness, come to this table and be fed. In just a moment, if you, we, uh, our leaders will dismiss people down the side aisles. If you've never partaken in our communion before, um, you'll come down the side aisles. We'll have communion available, two stands here. Um, if you want, uh, there's, there is a gluten-free option, and if you want more sanitary, because you take the bread, you dip it in the juice, and then you eat it. If you want, all those things are available for you, just request. And we also have prayer ministers, if you want to receive prayer as well. But let's respond. Let's worship together. Let's be in prayer while we're waiting to come forward and pray over these things in our lives. Feed your faith and starve your fears to death I want to be the voice to silence every threat I want to be your strength when you have nothing left And as you breathe me in you'll find with every breath I'm everything, everything, everything that you need just look around and you'll see only good comes from me here at the table you don't have to bring a thing i've got everything 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 that you need taste and see taste and see Just take my hand and lose your grip on all control You'll walk through valleys but you'll never walk alone I'll keep my promise, I'll be everywhere you go I'm gonna show you kindness like you've never known I am everything, everything, everything that you need Just look around and you'll see only good comes from me Here at the table, you don't have to bring a thing I've got everything, everything, everything that you need Taste and see Taste and see Draw a little bit closer Breathe a little bit deeper Come, you'll find your freedom I'm all you'll ever need Draw a little bit closer Breathe a little bit deeper Find your freedom, I'm all you'll ever need. So draw a little bit closer, breathe a little bit deeper. Come, you'll find your freedom, I'm all you'll ever need. Draw a little bit closer, breathe a little bit deeper. Come, you'll find your freedom. Everything, everything that you need Just look around and you'll see Only good comes from me Here at the table You don't have 
to bring a thing I've got everything, everything, everything that you need Taste and see Taste and see freedom I'm all you'll ever need draw a little bit closer breathe a little bit deeper come you'll find your freedom I'm all you'll ever
Sundays where everybody in here is probably thinking where did I go wrong and, and I it's not about that it's how do I go right and you go right by trusting in Jesus and you may say well you don't know the circumstances and I'm really hard and it's like well there's, there's two things to remember the harder the circumstance the more the power that's available and the other one is the greater the witness. So I don't know what circumstances you're in. I, I don't know what's going on. But I do know that this is where God's going to be working. Restoring families. Restoring uh, parents and children. And, and restoring workplace environments. And all of these things. And, and no matter how dark it is. You can walk into that situation and you can project light. So do what God calls you to do. The rest is on them. Please stand receive this blessing as we dismiss you here today. I pray that as you go now, you go knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day and a great holiday week.